My name's Kevin. How many of you like Nicki Minaj? What's your favorite song? Starships. Cool, because that has nothing to do with what I'm about to say. Um, I'm going to talk about school, and we're in school, school section. Um, claim, my main claim is that currently K-12 schools in America do not properly educate students. And I have three points to explain this. The first point is that the grading system in the public school, and well, it emphasizes grades too much. The second point is that the value of a student's education depends on the teacher. And the third point is that America's public schools are counterproductive. Uh, my first point, the grading system in K through 12 schools emphasizes grades too much. Um, the grading causes cheating, basically. There wouldn't be cheating if there were no grades. So ABC News said that authoritative, authoritative numbers are hard to come by, but according to a 2002 confidential survey of 12,000 high school students, 74% have been cheating on an examination at least once per year. And I'm sure many of you, sorry, probably have cheated. So, anyways, uh, good grades do not measure intelligence and put some students off from career opportunities. For example, Quentin Tarantino dropped out of high school, but he still made movies and acts. So, and then another point of that is grades cause children to think they cannot succeed later in life. Have you ever thought you failed a class and now you think you're going to fail at life and you have to kill yourself? Or something? No, don't do that. Okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> a quote from ABC News, the pressure for good grades is high. Grades can determine your future, and if you fail at this, then you're not, going to, you're not going to college, and you're going to work at McDonald's and live out of the car, said high school student Spike. So good job, you guys. Don't live in the car. Um, my second point is the value of a student's education depends on the teacher. No offense, Mr. Kirkman. Uh, <laughs> teachers who do not care about their student's education and only their paycheck do not properly educate your students. Um, and with the increasing number of students in each class, teachers cannot concentrate on each student equally. Greatschools.org said that gains associated with small classes generally appear when the class size is reduced to less than 20 students. Um, gains are stronger for students who come from groups that are traditionally disadvantaged in education, minorities and immigrants. Gains from class size re reduction in the early grades continue for students in the upgrades. And academic gains are not only the are not the only benefit of lowering class size. Basically, if you have less students in a class, then you'll be able to concentrate on them more, and you'll save money because they won't be held back. They'll be going through school, cruising through, and yeah, they'll be better than high school dropouts. Um, another point is that teachers' bias cannot be removed from their lessons. Camille Wilson Cooper's The Detrimental Act of Teacher Bias, Lessons Learned from the Standpoint of African American Mothers, says that a variety of scholars point to the denigrating impact that teacher's bias can have on students, given that a teacher's ideology is manifested through his or her instructional strategies and treatment of students. This directly impacts, impacts students' self-esteem and their motivation and inclination to itself. Okay, so my third point, is that America's public schools are counterproductive. So we go to school for, what, seven months? And then we go on a summer break for three months. I don't know about you, but I don't remember anything from the last year after I go to, some, like, go to summer. I forget about everything. So giving students a three-month break in their studies causes students to forget everything they learned in the past year. Time.com says that dull summers <coughs> take a steep toll as researchers have been documenting for more than a century. Deprived of healthy stimulation, Millions of low-income kids lose a significant amount of what they learn during the school year. Call it summer learning loss as academics do, or the summer slide, but by any name, summer vacation is among the most pernicious, if least acknowledged, causes of achievement gaps in American schools. And another point of why schools are being uh, counterproductive is that when students do something wrong, they are expelled instead of being educated on why or what they did was wrong. Tolerance.org says that when we tell kids they're not welcome back, we're essentially saying that they're beyond redemption and that we've given up. We can't disown our children. It contradicts the idea of education, of growing empowered humans. There must be a better way. And uh, my third point in that 
their main claim is that schools getting budget cuts get their programs cut. According to the Huffington Post, okay, double according. According to a report released last October by the Campaign for America's Future, evidence evidence suggests that cuts to education funding are leading to cutbacks from early childhood <coughs> education programs. Um, increases in class sizes and termination of art, music, physical education, and other elective subjects. Special programs are also being cut as a result, including those that assist students with special needs as well as advanced placement courses, extracurricular activities, and special academic programs for science, foreign language, and technology. I don't know what high schools you guys have been to, but for my high school, I wasn't able to take AP Calculus BC or AP Bio. Anyways, yeah, those were cut, and that kind of lost me money and stuff like that. I have to take them in college now. So, to summarize my three points, the K-12 schools in America do not properly educate students because the first, um, oh, the grading system in public school emphasizes grades too much. The value of a student's education depends on the teacher and America's public schools are kind of different. All right, well, structurally, things are in pretty good shape. I think uh, you, you have a point of view that, you're, uh, that you've told us about, and you've told us what the secondary points are going to be, uh, and that, that's okay. Um, I think uh, your signposting internally is, is also easy to follow. I, I'm not exactly sure how all of these points fit together uh, to, to make your point, except that they're random. Uh, attacks on general education approaches and and there's certainly plenty to criticize on all of those things. I think uh, you need to have more precise data because you're often summarizing ideas and presenting things as uh, factual without providing any source citation on it. For example, the, there's a whole body of information that talks about the loss of summer learning and I don't doubt that that's true but I don't know how you believe that it's true other than your own experience and that you say that there's a whole body of this but I don't have any reference to where that information came from. So I think that's a little bit problematic. Uh, the, the reference about um, class size, for instance, was the one that was the most particular. I thought that that was pretty good. And then there's a, there's a, a general quote about uh, teacher bias. I thought you gave us a source citation on that, but those were maybe the few places that there was a specific piece of citation on the information. A lot of other places there isn't that sort of citation. It's just taken as a general truism on some of those points. By the way, that one quote on uh, the teacher bias, that's so abstract that I'm not exactly sure what it's referring to. Is it referring to bias about the kid's ability to learn? Is it referring to, uh, given the source citation, it sounds like it might be referring to a bias based on ethnicity. Is it a bias about uh, what is uh, politically or culturally important and that there might be some difference that's going on there? I don't really know what that is supposed to refer to. So everybody has their point of view about what they think is important. The idea that that then undermines the ability to teach students effectively I think needs to be explained a heck of a lot more than you got here. So I thought the summer loss thing, although the citation, the evidence on that was a little weak, that explains one of the problems that's going on there. On the third point, you've got a whole bunch of random issues that are all being fitted together and I think that that's another place where it's problematic. Some of those things probably could have been put in the other points that you're developing um, and, and make those points a little stronger. Uh, let's see. A lot of times you're dependent on you know, a personal example or a singular example. You mentioned Tarantino. You mentioned at your high school they didn't have uh, AP uh, biology or some other classes. 
Well, where's the data that says that we've had sub substantial cuts in, um, you know, those kinds of programs? And it, it also seems to suggest that we don't need those programs. What do you need uh, AP Biology for if Tarantino can succeed without it? Uh, why do you need to have it? I'm not exactly sure what, that there's consistency on some of these arguments. Uh, so I think that you need to kind of focus a little bit more. And that, like I said, I think that's one of the problems with that third point is everything's so randomized in there. All right, thank you.